Chapter 11 The Crystal Throne As Justinian and his new servants continued through the pitch-black tunnels of the Martian underground, he began to sense a massive gathering of psychic energy. Here it is. The elite who said that it was a kilometer forward was, was correct, as very soon Justinian, his sixteen elites, and one hundred Martian soldiers emerged from the tunnel into a massive hollowed-out space. When they did so, they were spotted by some Martian guards who seemed to be of the soldier caste. When the Patriarch left to kill Justinian, along with thirty thousand of his army, they all expected victory. However, seeing that not only that out of thirty thousand, only a few hundred returned paralyzed them. It was even worse when the sixteen elites surrounding Justinian spread out and it was revealed what he held on his shoulder. The psychic weapon of their patriarch, their king, was held in his hands. They got out of his way because no one could say they could defeat the patriarch. If Justinian could not just kill him, and almost thirty thousand, what hope did they have? The guards at the entrance of the tunnel only numbered thirty, but he spent psychic probes to each one. Inside their minds, he showed them all the Psymagic Flame rubric and made them feel as if they were there when he cast it. These Martians all fell to their knees in screaming fits of terror as they tried to push him out of their minds. Sadly for them, Justinian was just starting to unlock the genetic inheritance of the Emperor. Without the warp, the Emperor's psyker talents were converted to psychic talents. The sheer weight of his mind, which was constantly growing stronger as his soul did. When it came to souls, no baseline human could compare to a regular custodes. He with two heavenly dragons was beyond even the custodes. In moments your patriarch and almost thirty thousand of your number were reduced to nothing. Think what will happen if I cast that spell once more, but down here. Step aside and don't even think of fleeing. Each of the thirty guards had families in this city, so they all stepped aside while shaking in terror. Seeing that made Remnosh glance back up at him. What was that? I just showed them my memory of casting the rubric, told them that if they tried to fight I would cast it again, but in the heart of their city. Even she who had been forced by him to stand in front of a raging fire for hours felt all her training was for nothing when faced with the flames he used. You won't, right? No, I would lose my city-state. She shivered as she knew that her master was going to make a terrifying warlord. However, her white Martian upbringing made her begin to gaze at him how she would as a patriarch. A true ruler. But there was only one title for now that was worthy. He had made a new title for himself, the Adeptus Dracones. Once Mars was under his command, only then could he think to call himself an emperor. As they continued to move forward, he began to see buildings. Everything was carved from stone with psychic might and by hand. Each stony building had several glowing plants growing from them. There was very little light down here as the Martians did not use fire. Fire could not burn on Mars normally since combustion needed oxygen. Mars didn't have oxygen to burn, only carbon dioxide, so they used psychic alternatives. Crystals were treated by a shaper to glow with a golden light, and plants gave off a natural glow in the dark. Remnosh squinted her eyes as she pointed to what Justinian could only call a pyramid. That is where the ruling family stays, and where the location of the city's crystal pillar resides. Advance to the pyramid, prepare for battle. His enslaved troops did not want to fight their own kind of city, but they were under contract. Their own bodies moved against them, preparing for battle as he instructed. The deeper they moved into the city, the more Martians he saw. They all had expected the Patriarch and his warriors to return with his head, but the opposite happened. The Patriarch was nowhere to be seen, and his prized psychic glaive was in his hand. Against J. Ostinian, they had sent thirty thousand soldiers, twenty elites, and a few war shapers. The unfortunate thing was is that he had not even delayed and directly cast the rubric. He had wiped out the forward army with ease. The remaining population of the city now consisted of a majority of laborers, left behind soldiers who had lost the biggest amount to their population, and shapers who had not lost many. As for elites, twenty was not a big loss, but having them be enslaved against their families was. As before Justinian used his psychic might to press onto the minds of every Martian he passed. 
They all were fed images of him casting the rubric and the knowledge that he could cast it with even more power. None dared to move against him until they reached the foot of the pyramid. At the steps leading up to the peak, he saw several Martian elites standing a few steps between each other. In total, he saw about twenty, which was the same amount that he had been sent to kill him. He grinned as he moved forward to the front of his elites and soldiers. When the twenty Martians saw him with the weapon of their leader, they all felt rage enter their hearts. They all began to move down the steps with their giant spears ready to kill him. However, he just opened his right hand, which was currently free, and conjured more of Dedrag's deadly flames. One fireball, an example, should do it. He pulled his arm back and launched the fireball at one of the first elites who had been on the floor. In front of his team, which had been trained never to falter, did this time. The fire was already bad enough since the Guardians themselves had instilled in them a fear of fire. However, seeing Dreg's soul-destroying flames strike near them froze them in their place. They all watched as the white Martian elite guard who was struck began to scream as the flames burned through his protective gear with ease. In his pain, fear, and irrationality, he rushed at his partner and grabbed him. Help me! His partner was just dragged alongside him to oblivion as their bodies, minds, and souls burned away. Justinian opened his right hand once more to create a second fireball, this time ten times larger. That was just a warning. I can produce far worse than a tiny little fireball. These flames don't just destroy the body, my friends, but the very soul. If you do not wish to face oblivion, sign this. He activated his contract spell once more, giving the 18 elites a chance. Place a drop of your blood on the page or be destroyed soul and all. Your choice? These elites were trained to be absolutely loyal, never betray their master or even defect, but that was when they thought they would join their god Ronmir in the afterlife. If Justinian's flames could prevent that, they all instantly tossed away any honor they may have held. The fear of total nothingness was a fate worse than death, so they placed their blood on the page. With that simple act, Justinian now held thirty-five elites under his control, which he took full advantage of. Lead me forward to the peak. I shall be taking the crystal pillar for myself. Soldiers, stand at the bottom and prevent anyone from rising to stop me. The one hundred soldiers all gathered at the bottom of the stairs as his thirty-five elites led him up the stairs. As he moved, Remnosh, who made thirty-six, turned to him. Do your flames really destroy the soul? They do. I try to not use them as much as possible because of that, but I felt forced to. This, of course, was a lie, as he could have just used regular dragonfire. It would have been much easier for him then, but he wanted to place the fear of oblivion in his enemies. If they knew they had an afterlife, they would be less afraid to die. However, if they found out that their afterlife was not possible, if they died to his true flames, they would think twice before facing him. Rimnash shivered, as that could have been her if she had not signed. Feeling her thoughts, he brought a hand out and patted her shoulder. Just now was he starting to realize it, but his apotheosis into a custodes was slowly making him more like them. His mind was his to control, his emotions were there, and he held no loyalty to the emperor. However, his emotions were slowly going through two extremes. As a possessor of two Hanley dragons, his emotions were going in the direction of extremes, but as a custodes they were starting to weaken. He would need to find a delicate balance to not fall into either extreme. No emotion was not what he wanted, and unstable draconic rage was also not on the table. Are you upset? She shook her head. No, just terrified. How often will you use those flames? Not often, they are dangerous after all, but remember that I have an even scarier ability, a poison that destroys all organic matter and the soul. If I feel the need to fuse both, nothing will live. He didn't speak more as they made it to the very top of the pyramid. From what he could tell, the ruling family lived in the pyramid that could only be entered from the massive hollow opening at the peak. When he entered the peak, he saw another large Martian who he assumed was the mother of Remnosh. She was around twenty-five feet tall, and she was currently on her knees in horror. She had felt her mate's last moments, and the Link had fed her his last thoughts. 
Even now, all she could see were those dark red flames that seemed to have taken over her mind. Seeing her mother like this just made Remnosh scowl. Get up, your daughter is here. Her mother did not speak for several seconds before looking up at Justinian. She began to shake in place before she started to drag herself back. No, stay away. He saw her lunge for the wall where she had hanged a dual-bladed psychic force weapon. He just squinted his eyes as he attacked her mind with his psychic pressure. Since her mind was already unstable, she could barely hold him off. While he fought her psychically, he spoke to his elites. Subdue her. He saw ten of them rush toward her and they began to pin her down. Since Martians could phase through solid matter, they had means to prevent it. Justinian watched as they brought out some chains from their pouches. From what he could feel they were treated with psychic energy. They were made to stop prisoners from phasing out of prison, but the chains were used to stop them. Once her body was held down, and he beat her in the psychic duel, he passed out. Once she was taken care of, he turned to the biggest thing that was held up here. It was a gigantic crystal that was glowing with psychic energy. Nearly every Martian in this city-state was linked to it, and one of the psychic nodes of the noble families. Now, he was going to take over, and the first step was to take over the pillar. Remnosh, how do I do this? If the previous patriarch is overthrown, you just use your own psychic energy to place your own imprint showing your right to rule. He hummed as the crystal was even taller than he was, almost three times taller, so he reached out and placed a gauntleted hand on the crystal. He took a deep breath before he surged his psychic energy into the crystal. He began to force out the imprint of the previous patriarch and his mate, causing her to shake at the broken link. After that, the glow of the crystal died down, but he was just getting started. Once it was dim, he began to surge an ungodly amount of psychic energy. Slowly, the crystal began to glow from a dirty yellow to the brightest of gold in the center. Around it, a dark purple glow began to form as Justinian took control of the pillar. However, he was unsatisfied, and he slowly began to change the shape of the giant crystal. Under the eyes of the elites and Remnosh, the psychic pillar of their city began to shrink and grow out until the entire crystal formed a glowing crystalline throne made for Justinian. Once the psychic crystal pillar had transformed into a throne, Justinian took his rightful place and sat down. The moment he sat, he closed his mind as his control over the psychic pillar surged through the different nodes the nobles controlled. Their own pillars also began to change to suit his colors. In moments, Justin, Ian was inside the psychic net formed by the white Martians over the city. The sheer weight of his psychic might pressed on the minds of laborers, shapers, soldiers, and elites all the same. This was just the effect of unlocking the power held in the Emperor's blood. His psychic might had already reached this point, but it still did not compare to the Emperor yet, though it was good for now. Tam Justinian Arcadius Valorus Valdor, and this is now my city. Your patriarch is dead, your army is exterminated, and your elites are under my control. Any who refuse the new order shall face the same fate as your army. Suddenly inside the minds of every Martian in the city, they were faced with the images of the rubric. 90k Martians started to scream as those terrible flames entered their minds. They could swear they felt them burn even as memories. Can cast that spell at any time, but I am a merciful ruler. I will bring you prosperity or death. Pick. When he left the psychic net, he left a slimmer of connection feeding him information. In the coming months, things were going to be hectic for the white Martian race. Now that they had him to deal with, he just had to get some technology, which he would get from any of the billionaires he knew of. If Bruce wouldn't do it, then Lex Luthor, Oliver Queen, or Simon Stagg. The villains, they would of course are bound in some serious enslavement contracts, but for Bruce Wayne and Oliver, simple diplomacy would do. Who knew I would become a warlord? You never thought about it. No, after graduation I was going to become an entrepreneur and make my own business. Guess I still can. You plan to show that cooperation between Mars and Earth is possible? Correct. Slowly, I can take over Earth until I own Mara and Earth. From there, who knows? Maybe a great crusade is in order. In a few decades or centuries from now, of course. 
He was not playing in years, as he would never die of old age. If he managed to become a perpetual, very little would kill him. Chapter 12. The Preparations Once Justinian took his rightful place on his psychic throne, much like the golden throne of the emperor, he closed his eyes and began to enforce his will already. He was a much stronger being now than he had been when he arrived, enough to be confident against a majority of beings with a few big exceptions. The Presence, Lucifer Morningstar, Michael Demiurgos, the Anti-Monitor who killed Darkseid, and a few other beings. The gods were fair game though, as he did not fear them. However, he had only been in the game of supernatural powers for thirteen weeks. As long as he kept in his lane and played the long game, he would come out on top, eventually. For now, he would set the foundation of his future empire. He raised his hand and used a very useful useful that Didrag and Albion taught him. How to form a barrier or a bounded field which he used to seal the entire city. Once the bounded field was set up, he smirked as he looked out at the gold and purple barrier. It shimmered with dragon mana and psychic energy, which was his specialty now. Since it contained both, you would need both at a high degree to break it or just be stronger than he was. With that, he had effectively trapped 90,000 Martians inside a city with him. He leaned back into his throne as his psychic energy was flooding inside the net. This way, he was forcing his will into anyone connected to the net making his power known. Not a single Martian, laborer, shaper, soldier, or elite could say they were a stronger telepath than him. That was not even talking about mages because in this city they had none. Martians had evolved to have psychic powers, not magic. He planned to change that because he wanted to have loyal psi mages who could use both powers. He could not be the only mage in his new Imperium. Without the warp to worry about, he could set up a proper intergalactic empire without worrying about the Immaterium or the Chaos Gods. He just had to worry about the multitude of powerful alien races, which is why he wanted the Martians under him. They were one of the heavy hitters, and with proper genetic modification, they would be even stronger. Even just their original burning Martian forms were very strong, and if he could create a caste like them with the ability to reproduce asexually removed, they would make excellent shock troops. As he was in thought, Remnosh and the other elites all looked around at the giant barrier that had been cast. Nothing could go in or out without his permission. Expect those who had been bound to his service since he would need them to leave and enter the barrier for him at times. This was a good time to speak to the Martians to state his goals. The barrier shall remain up for three months. No one goes in or out. Enjoy your time with me. I know that I will. He rested his arms on his throne armrests and he turned to his elites. Most of them were already connected to the net, except Remnosh. She took this chance to link back up with it as when she had been left behind, she had been cut from it. Once she was linked back up, Justinian turned to her. Remnosh, I am going to place my trust in you. So this psychic link doesn't mean anything to you, does it? She crossed her arms and leaned down to look at him. I know it is effectively a marriage to your kind, but to me, it is more of a convenience. Forgive me for the cultural difference. She just smirked as she sat down on his lap. You are good, my king. I am just glad you didn't become some lovey-dovey simp all of a sudden. None of the elites around him said a thing about how forward she was, but he wrapped an arm around her very toned waist. He did love toned women like this form. Tam going to make you a champion, Remnosh, a queen among your race. She reached around and wrapped her arm behind his head. Your queen? One of them. Fair. For now, he ignored her as he began to devour the information shared through the psychic net. This is how he learned more about the population of the city. There were only two noble houses besides the ruling F, Amely, and their numbers were not too great. Each one had around 15 elites, meaning that in a city that numbered around 120,000, there were only around 60 to 80 elites, which showed how small their total population was. Using his processing speed, he managed to get numbers for the castes. The laborers, which made up the vast majority, made up around 60,000 of the total population. They had made up half of the population before he wiped out 30,000 soldiers. As for the soldiers, they used to number 50,000. 
Now they were reduced to just 20,000, leaving 10,000 shapers and around 60 to 100 elites, ranging from full-grown to children. If his numbers were correct, he had killed three elites and the patriarch, so the number had gone down somewhat. He controlled 36 elites, meaning he controlled a little more than half of the elites. That was good enough for now, as he was soon going to control every elite in this city. Once he had cemented his rule and prepared for the unification wars of Mars, he would be ready. This is going to be long and tedious. Glad I have time. Once the barrier went up, the Martians were cut off from escape. They would not starve since white Martians were hardy and they had supplies to last their vastly shrunk population. None of them, even the two noble houses, tried to cause trouble because they truly feared Justinian. The knowledge of the rubric and the soul-destroying flames had captured their hearts, filling them with dread. Everyone who looked up at the pyramid could see that he had cast several illusions to obscure what was going on inside. None had any clue as to what he was up to because he had not done anything major once he took control. Several individuals tried to find a weakness in the bounded field, but after the barrier retaliated and reduced the offenders to atoms, they didn't try again. What Justinian was doing was preparing for the wars that were going to come. To do this, he psychically bonded to five infant bioships which were kept by the ruling family. Bioships were a natural species of creature on Mars that were effectively living technology. According to Remnosh, the bioship race changed as a result of their master's thoughts and desires, which was apparent. Thanks to having access to not just psychic energy of exceptional purity from Justinian and Dragon Mana, his bioships had already begun to evolve. They changed from small ships into baby Predacons, effectively. He named them Prediking, Rampage, Devastator, Grimlock, and Grendel. Very quickly, the five small Predacons, as he was calling them, were changing to suit his desire. In a few years, he would have five living robot dragons that would act just like Predacons. He had time to wait for them to grow, so he went on with the next part of his plans. He took control of all the laborers, soldiers, shapers, and any infant elites inside the underground of the pyramid. There were only five at the moment, but they would be fully grown in ten years. With that, the entire ruling family and what remained of their forces were bound to his servitude. The third major action he took involved Dudreg and Albion as the three of them began to create new, stronger magic spells and rituals. While dragons didn't use many, being as long-lived as they were and the number of hosts they had had in their original world, they had learned a great deal. Even without the souls of the previous wielders, heavenly dragons like them did not forget. With hundreds of hosts between them who had used different types of magic, they were well informed. All this information was given to Justinian, who went on to create several useful rituals. The only one who was given any knowledge of his plans was Remnosh, who he kept at his side for the most part. She followed him around and was his source of information. The final thing was that he collected all the psychic equipment that the army that attacked him had worn. He then melted that down alongside the psychic focus glaive of the Patriarch to build a forge room. Thanks to being the ruling family, their shapers had giant warehouses of metal. Mose, teal iron, titanium, copper, zinc, tungsten, gold, and magnesium. Most psychic focus weapons were made of steel. What made them so strong was how they were forged with psychic energy rather than fire. He felt that it had its benefits, but these common metals would not do for his unification wars. He would need to find a way to produce something up to par with adamantium from 40k or vibranium. For now, though he began to experiment to see how dragonfire reacted with mundane ore. The best one was steel because steel was the best mundane metal for swords and armor. He found that dragon steel was the best material for now and the easiest to produce. It was also many times stronger than normal steel because the flames came from a dragon-like D-drag. When he added psychic energy, the metal became both in tune to mana and psychic energy. Once he had his answer, he forced the 5,000 shapers of the ruling family to help him, which caused the white Martian shapers extreme panic, since being that close to fire caused them to panic. He had ordered them to ignore their fears, which worked, and they worked alongside him. 
No one died, and he managed to create his forge room. It was primitive, which cemented the idea that he had to get a rich billionaire under his control to supply him with the technology he wanted. For now, once the forge room was up and running, he and his shapers got to work on reforging the psychic focus blades of his elites. The new psychic focus weapons, once they were forged, the blades surged with fire when psychic energy surged inside. Once an elite psychically bonded to their new blades, their fear of flames began to dissipate. They even received armor that had been forged in dragon fire, causing the gear to contain a spark of flame. Unlike the blades, the elites tried to refuse to wear the armor because the fear of the fire had been too great. He simply ordered them which caused them extreme panic as the sets of armor went on. He let them panic for several minutes as they believed to be burning. Rimnosh was also afraid when her armor went on, but unlike the other elites, she did not panic. She fought against her ingrained instincts to fear fire, as Justinian had shown her that it was just mental. Dragonfire was unique, but she had somewhat started to get over her fears. Justinian and his shapers also worked to start arming the remaining soldiers, which were only a few hundred. He had killed most of the soldiers that belonged to the ruling family. The 20,000 that remained belonged to the two noble families, which he knew were pooling their resources. They knew he was going to go after them, and their time was shrinking. A month and a half after he had sealed away the city, Justinian and his forces were ready to move out. He was still going to keep the city locked away for three months, but once his forces controlled everything, he would be going to Earth for a diplomatic meeting. His true goal was to convince Lex Luthor, Vandal Savage, and Simon Staggs to fund him. He needed advanced technology to kickstart his inventions because he was smart and he knew what he had to do. But why start from scratch when he could just use what already existed to jump from? It would allow him to start recreating some of the technology of the 41st millennium. Much like an orc weird boy, his genetic memory had kickstarted. He knew what he had to do, and it would make his unification of Mars much easier. His plans were starting to fall into place, but first he would fully control the two noble houses before anything else. Chapter 13 the fear of oblivion. I made a mistake about the growth rate of Martians. Miss Martian in the Young Justice TV show is 48 years old, but is 16 compared to a human. The Martians of New Cadia City began to feel like they were only lambs to be slaughtered once the barrier was set up. They could not escape, and fighting back was a fool's errand. After the terrifying display of the barrier retaliating and killing those who tried to break it, they did not dare touch it. As for the servants of the ruling family who had been taken into Justinian's service, they would leave the pyramid and barrier. They were sent out to the mines to collect more ore to be fed to the forges that had been created deep underground. Justinian had the laborers and shapers work alongside him to melt down iron ore to dragon steel. The strength of the Martian race even of weak laborers allowed them to lift several tons without trouble. They could mine without the need for heavy equipment other than their dragon steel pickaxes and hammers. As for the noble houses of Sumdale and Preagenia, they locked themselves away in their stone estates. They could not leave as the barrier also expanded underground, meaning they were trapped. As for Justinian, since he created his crystal throne, his powerful mind was a constant pressure in the psychic net. Everyone could sense his psychic presence, which was scarily growing stronger daily. No one could ignore it, but the day they dreaded came. The third week of the second month came, and the, the illusions placed over the pyramid went down. Every Martian looked up at the pyramid as they saw almost 800 Martian soldiers walking down the steps. Each one was wearing dragon steel armor with large spears and shields. Image here. These equipment were not psi magic weapons, as Justinian and his shapers did not have the time to equip them all with those. However, the quality of this equipment was not low, as anything forged in dragon fire was powerful. These weapons could pierce Martian flesh with ease, and the soldiers wielding them were disciplined. The honor of psi magic weapons went only to his honor guard, which consisted of his 36 elites. Though, his troops did not appear to be Martians, as he had them all shapeshift to appear human. 
The soldiers were space marine sized, and their armor had a few symbols. On the chest plate was a two-headed dragon rather than a two-headed eagle of the Imperium. On the pauldrons were the symbols of a bear dragon skull and a sword with wings on it. As the 800 soldiers moved down with grim efficiency, Justinian and his 36 elites moved down behind them. He had not just been forging as he had been training as well. The cause for the rise of his psychic might was that he was unlocking more of the emperor's genetic inheritance. According to Dedragon Albion, his soul was a bright gold and purple even after almost five months with both of them, it still had not become the soul of a dragon. The good news was that from what they could tell, it was taking their power to grow itself. Even better was that the boosted gear and divine dividing were bound to his armor, which was part of his soul. As such, they, they were growing stronger as well. This had not been possible since God had placed limiters on their souls. With those gone, the two heavenly dragons were on their way to recovering their full power and even exceeding it. For now, though Justinian focused his mind on the purges that were going to come. He was not just with his honor guard as behind him were his five pet Predacons. Predaking, Rampage, Devastator, Grimlock, and Grendel had been growing. Bioships grew quickly as long as their master fed them with psychic energy daily. He had fed them mana as well, which caused the five of them to already be 45 feet long. The Predacons were massive and covered in weapons appearing to suit their namesake images here. He looked to his left and right at his honor guard, 36 Martian elites in full armor. Each set of armor appeared to be on fire as a spark of Dreg's flames was trapped in a atch armor. The Martians who wore it for prolonged periods began to lose their fear of the fire as well. Image here. As for their wearers, he had made them all shapeshift to appear like Primarch-sized humans. Each one was 15 feet tall, which made them taller than him. He had shaped them all personally, trained them, and subjected them to magic rituals to increase their strengths. As for the weapons they wielded, they all had glaives or greatswords, except for Remnosh. She had taken to wielding two curved greatswords, and he had personally forged her armor in the soul-destroying dragon flames. He turned to regard her as she was surrounded by her own honor guard of only females. He had also shaped each one to suit his wishes, like a chaos god would shape their daemons. Out of 36 elites under his control, there were only five females. Behind his five Predacons emerged the War Shapers. Out of the 5,000 Shapers he had under him, only 500 were classified as War Shapers, those who could shape their psychic energy for battle. The War Shapers had psi magic staffs to allow them to better control it in their psychic nets. Their armor was light because Justinian had not worked on it. They had to shape the dragon steel for themselves, but once his troops were armed, he said his will across the net. By the end of the day, the two noble families will be subdued and under my tool. This can go peacefully or not. Be prepared for both. He got an instant response through the psychic net he shared with his troops. By your will, our king. Advance. The sound of 1,300 heavily armored troops and five Predacons marching was easily audible. The Martians down in the city all received a single message from Justinian. This is my will. The two noble houses are to present themselves for battle or surrender. As for the rest of the people, keep your heads down and you shall be fine. As Justian moved, he looked behind him at his five pet Predacons. Rampage, Devastator, Grimlock, and Grendel split into teams of two and go surround the homes of the nobles. If you see anyone attempt to fight back, blast them. The four dragons took to the sky, and as he ordered split into pairs, Predaking stayed behind as he was going to be his ship or mount when he got larger. Regardless, he gripped his guardian spear as he moved. Remnosh next to him through their psychic link asked a question. So what happens once the two noble families are subdued? Simple. Once they are compliant, we will set up New Cadia City and send a diplomatic mission to Earth. My goal is to bring true technology to Mars so I can build a lab from where I can create technology from the 41st millennium. My helmet's memory banks have plenty of plans and designs to work with. Once I have prepared enough, the unification wars of Mars will begin and the entire planet will be mine. What about the Justice League? 
They won't like you moving against Earth while we white Martians are enemies to them. We tried to invade Earth four years ago, but we got pushed back by the Justice League and the armies of Earth. How many casualties did you cause? Remnosh thought back as she had not gone to Earth. I think the Martian invasion killed around 250 million people worldwide. He was honestly surprised they did not kill more, as that was very little. What is the total Martian population if you know it? Remnosh had to think about this, but she remembered her father telling her some stuff when he still found her useful. In total, I think it is at 150 million in total. Our reproduction is slow and so is our growth. We also war a lot against each other and deaths are quite common. It keeps our populations down and we have very little technology. Our only means of space travel is our bioships, and they are living creatures that were bred to be ships. Other than that, we are very primitive. Exactly. I will fix that in time to bring Mars to a true civilization. As for Terra, my true goal is to slowly begin to replace government leaders with white Martian infiltrators, especially China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and Afghanistan. Once those countries are controlled by loyal infiltrators, they will pass pro-Martian alliance policies that will aid me. Terra had resources that I wanted, but once proper infrastructure is set up here, we will move to the deeper solar system. Terra will not be invaded, as I do not want it to become an irradiated wasteland. It is the jewel of mankind, and I will not lose all its life because of a hasty invasion. Rimnosh smiled behind her helmet. Sounds good to me. He focused back as he focused on his connection to his Predacons. Rampage, Devastator, Grimlock, and Grendel were already flying in circles around the large noble houses of the Sumdale and Priagenia. The actions of the two were very different, as Zumdale, which Rampage and Devestor were circling, had chosen to fight. Their fifteen elites and their lord charged out alongside their war shapers and soldiers. Justinian squinted his eyes as he communicated with his forces. Move to House Sumdale. Fly now. He, his troops, and Predaking all took to the sky and began to fly toward the first house that chose to fight back. When they arrived at the first noble house, he saw his two Predacons locked in battles with twenty bioships. The living ships and their pilots began to fire weapons the ships had created, mostly laser weapons that bounced off the Cymagic shields his pets had. His Predacons were evolved bioships, so despite their seemingly unmaneuverable shapes, they moved magically. He watched as Devastator roared and surged with mana and psychic energy, and almost teleported in front of an unfortunate ship. He swooped down on it and grabbed it with his metal talons. He tore the ship in half, killing it, and he lunged into the head of the creature to devour its pilot. His brother was no less brutal, as he took a deep breath and began to spray flames all around him in a typhoon of psi-magic flames. Justinian roared his orders through the link. Predaking, aid your brothers. Everyone else, descend. At his order, Predaking flew up to help his two smaller brothers finish the battle faster. Meanwhile, he and his honor guard were the first to go down to face the ruler of the house Sumdal and his honor guard. His army was larger as he had 10,000 soldiers, but they would not win the battle. The lord squinted his eyes as he raised his sword. Soldiers, wear them down with your lives. Before anything happened, Justinian spoke through the psychic net which he controlled. Refuse that order. There is no need to lose your lives for a battle already lost. Join my side and earn my favor. The lord in his rage looked at Justinian with eyes burning like fire-blasted rays of heat vision. Justinian did not need to even defend himself, as two of his honor guards raised their great shields and blocked the blasts for him. You are a false king, not even a mar. Before the lord could finish his words, the two elites at his side, which were his own sons, turned to him and impaled his body with their spears. The lord roared in pain at the betrayal. Despite his power, the betrayal hurt even more. He was almost the same size as the former patriarch, but his sons wounded him. Before he could retaliate, his brother, who was standing behind him, stabbed him through the chest with his glaive. The other elites all followed the example and began to repeatedly stab their psychic focus weapons into his body over and over again. They cut his head off, his arms, and stabbed his organs until he was dead. Justinian, his honor guard, 
and soldiers moved forward as the elites did not stop stabbing their own lord until he was nothing more than a pile of bloody flesh. By the time he moved forward, the elites all fell to their knees alongside the soldiers and shapers. We surrender to your rule. Justinian smiled as he had barely needed to battle. The fear of oblivion was greater than any loyalty they may have had. Good, sign the contracts. En masse, he created the servitude spell, and he watched as each of the Martians signed them, raising his soldiers to new numbers. His elites also increased, which were as they were named elites. Good, all you have submitted today shall earn my favor in the coming years. Remember this day as the day you choose to keep your souls intact. Behind him landed his three Predacons, who all had killed the bioships sent against them. When the three dragons landed, the elites and former army knew they had made the correct choice. Now we move to House Priagenia. Let us hope they choose correct as you did. He took to the sky, followed by his troops and the new ones he had taken from the noble house. He is not going to enslave every single Martian just the main ones of New Cadia City, as the rest will slowly be conquered. Chapter 14. Diplomacy and Construction Once Justinian had bolstered his elites with an extra 15 and 10,000 more soldiers, he had his army fly to House Priagenia. His five Predacons were already circling the stone building, and unlike House Sundal, the Lord walked out alone, unarmed. When Predaking, Rampage, Grimlock, Devastator, and Grendel saw him, they landed in front of him. The Martian noble kneeled down and through the psychic net said as such, Your Majesty, please spare me. I and House Priagenia shall not raise our blades. When Justinian, his honor guard, and his troops landed the Patriarch, did away with his pride and lowered his head as Justinian and his guards walked forward. Please, my king, spare my life and clan. We shall serve. Justinian kneeled in front of the large Martian who was around twenty-five feet tall. They may be taller than him, but their size did not intimidate him. T am glad you have chosen to live. This city is now named New Cadia, and things will change. You will remain in charge of your house and your troops as a loyal vassal. Of course, you shall all sign contracts of servitude. This is not a debate. Sign the contract. Through the psychic pillar held by House Priagenia, he sent a contract to the fifteen elites they controlled, their ten thousand soldiers, and their shapers. He felt his psychic energy and mana stores fall, but they were rising back up quickly. As a result of his powerful soul and constant training, his reserves were massive. Once every contract was signed, he felt every servant bound to his service. He released his unrestrained aura that pressed on the wills of every Martian in the city. Listen well to my words, Martians of this city. I have no intention of enslaving your entire race. That is not a civilization, just a bunch of slaves. However, every empire starts with slaves who become citizens in time. Your race was the aggressor against your brother's race, the Green Martians. Now I have conquered you. Things in the coming years will look grim, since peace won't be a thing that will last. When the wars I have planned are complete, you will remember my name for all time. The barrier will go down at the end of the next month but we will start to work on improvement. i rather not be a cruel ruler, but your race is full of cruel beings. I will answer that cruelty in kind, but I will answer your loyalty with mercy in return. Do not fail my expectations, because who says it has to be your city? Remember these words, the rubric will burn again if it has to. When he stopped speaking, he turned to Remnosh, who was gazing up at him with stars in her eyes. This was a true warlord, and as a white Martian elite, there was nothing more attractive than a proper ruler. Justinian did like the way she looked at him, but this was just a start. He turned around to gaze at his honor guard, his newly replenished troops, and the many shapers he had under his control. Plus, there were still 80,000 Martians in this city that all could be put to work. There was so much work to do, but if everyone played their part, his setup would be perfect. Two weeks and a month to get some infrastructure built for my science lab. So much work, but so many Martians to do it. He smiled to himself as he and his troops began to move to the pyramid. These aliens don't know that the longer you are allowed to live, the stronger you will get. They won't even know how much of a monster you will become in a decade, much less a century.
Don't forget that we still have the principles of domination and supremacy from God. While they might not be anything big in this reality, they are still powers taken from God, who is on the level of the dragon gods. If you can inherit those and make your own dragon-based ability, I bet even the gods of this world will fear for their lives. That brings the question, why is the presence not doing anything about me? Unless I am part of his grand plan for some reason. I do not like to think about such a being at times like this. Omnipotence and omniscience is such a terrifying concept to Ev and a heavenly dragon like me. You think I am not worried? What matters is that you two must ascend into dragon gods. You are growing stronger as I am right? Yes, our sacred gears are part of your armor which is soul bounded to your powerful soul. As for our souls, as your soul gets stronger, our souls passively feed it our energy and vice versa. At the rate we are going, I and Drag may be able to take that step to join Great Red and Ophis at their level. If that happens, your power will rise to our level if you are not already there. We will need to if we want to face Darkseid and the rest of the gods. Since our souls are unshackled, this is our advantage. Soul attacks will be shared between us three, and strong telepaths have three minds to deal with. Which reminds me, Justinian, you need to get some proper mental wards just in case your Auramite Halo and Custodes defenses get breached. Agreed. When he and his dragon friends finished their talk, they had reached the pyramid. When he reached the top, he took his place on his throne with Remnosh quickly sitting on his lap. Predicking, Rampage, Grimlock, Devastator, and Grendel all began to fly around the city as a constant reminder of his presence. Inside, his honor guard surrounded him but he was unsatisfied. His guard would not be ready until he had 10,000 custodes or equivalent worthy troops. Until then, he would take as many steps as it took to reach the top. With a body that did not feel the effects of age, he would have thousands of years if he was not killed. He would take that time to his advantage as he could outlive many with ease. Time was on his side. He grinned as he wrapped his arm around Remnosh, causing her to smile in his hold begin. The next two weeks marked he sign of massive work going down underground. Ramonas sent thousands of Martians to mine as much ore as they could. That was then sent through the giant forges, smelted the ore into dragon steel. The shapers then took that and turned that into properly forged cymagic weapons. Justinian slowly used his control over the psychic net to replace the fear of fire the Martians had with respect. He ordered the construction of more forges and something on the surface. In the two weeks since Justian ordered the renovation, Bruce was constantly in the Batcave under Wayne Manor, looking at the satellites of Mars. Specifically, he was looking at the underground stairway that Justinian had ordered built. Since then, he had wondered what the hell was going underground, because from the staircase, large quantities of white Martians surged out. Justinian never did emerge, but he saw them start a giant project. Thousands of them worked around the clock with their psychic might and muscle, as thousands more brought up metal, stone, and material as they began to build a fortress. It was a giant project as giant livestock, and many different castes worked in shifts to construct it. The scariest part was when Predaking emerged who slept nearby to bask in the sun. The Predacon was not much bigger, but according to Remnosh, he would keep growing as he fed on Justinian's mana and psychic energy. He even saw some of Justinian's troops emerge in full armor as they directed the construction. No one was whipped. They worked in 12-hour shifts, which to a Martian was not at all bad. They received 15-minute breaks every three hours and one-hour lunch at the end. He could also see what he could only call children helping with the lifting. Even a white Martian child could lift hundreds of pounds, so construction was fast. He had been keeping a close eye on the construction as it was speeding up lately, but it was still nowhere near complete. Master Bruce, what do you think is happening? He squinted his eyes as he answered his butler. That custodies from the future. He went underground two months ago and this just happened. Something has changed. His satellite zoomed in to gaze at a member of Justinian's soldiers, specifically at the refined steel armor, which he did not realize was not normal. White Martians wear very little armor. Since he went underground, more and more of these shape-shifted soldiers are showing up. 
They are all wearing refined knight armor with weapons of exceptional quality, Alfred hummed. He is building a surface fortress, arming his troops, and creating robot dragons? Bruce shook his head as he looked at Predaking. No, I think I know what that is. John captured one four years ago. It is a bioship. Creatures tamed by green and white Martians alike. John explained it that they feed on psychic energy to suit their master's wishes. We are looking at Justinian's wishes, a robot dragon. Alfred now felt it was time to worry. Should we inform the Justice League? He did come from the 41st millennium, and he said his people controlled Terra, which is Earth. He may want to take over it once more. Bruce leaned forward as something happened. Rampage, Grimlock, Devastator, and Grendel emerged from the underground one after the other, and behind them were 1,000 Martians wearing more dragonsteel armor. That was alarming already, but when Justinian's honor guard emerged, he felt everything he knew about Martians was false. The 36 Martians wearing burning fire armor was not supposed to happen. In the middle of these Martians was Justinian, but behind them were war shapers. One thousand of them now, which Bruce felt that this may need league intervention. Diana trusted Justinian, but he did not. Before he could do anything, he watched as Justinian held his hand out. He created a purple and gold spiraling portal before he pointed forward. Only four of the dragons walked through, leaving the big one behind. Then the one thousand Martian soldiers, Justinian, his thirty-six elites, and the one thousand shapers. In total, that was two thousand thirty-six Martians who went God knows where. Bruce began to tap away at the bat computer as he began to search the grid for any disturbance. His sensors detected something in Washington, D.C. from the Hall of Justice. While the Watchtower was the true Justice League base, Batman had placed as many sensors in the Hall for this event. His satellites and the Bat computer showed him that the portal had opened right in front of the White House. Damn it, Alfred, call the Justice League. At once, Master Bruce. Batman tossed his cowl back on as he ran to get into the Bat plane. Justinian, of course, was not here for war. He was here for diplomacy. He did not open his portal past the White House gate as he and his troops appeared fifty feet from the gate. Rampage, Grimlock, Devastator, and Grendel walked to the four corners of his forces as he started to walk forward. As they walked forward, Remnosh took a deep breath. It smells so nice on Earth. He had to agree. It does, doesn't it? This is why I do not want nukes going off on the crown jewel of my species. As his forces approached the White House, he saw the Secret Service begin to mount a defense. They came out armed in sci-fi armor, aimed at advanced laser weapons, and even prepared to set off the nuclear device placed in the White House if they had to. Justinian raised his guardian spear, causing his troops to all stop as he felt the approach of the Justice League. Some came down through Zeta beams and they began to surround him and his guards. Remember, no fighting. I am here on a diplomatic mission. By your will, your majesty. Superman placed himself between Justinian's forces and the White House. He did not jump to conclusions and ask Justinian directly. Justinian, I will ask first. What is the meaning of this? Justinian held his arm out and motioned forward. He moved forward with just Remnosh and five of his honor guard. The rest stayed behind in a formation waiting for his mental command. When he stepped out from his forces, he reached up and removed his helmet. Superman, it is good to see you once more. I am not here for war, the opposite in fact. Superman landed as the rest of the League began to land. T will hear you out. Thank you, Superman. I am here on a diplomatic mission, and these forces here are white Martians who have joined my banner to create a union between Terra and Mars. They have taken me as their ruler, and since Terra is my home, I want to prevent its irradiation. As such, peace between humanity and the white Martian race is for the best. Superman looked into Justinian's golden eyes and saw no flicker of a lie. However, he had easy ways to confirm things. You must realize that it does not appear to Earth that way. Your troops are in full armor, you have four giant dragons, and you arrived where the President of America and his family live. The White Martians invaded Earth four years ago, and they killed millions. That is not forgotten. Justinian nodded. T have been informed. But you need to understand that just like humanity is split into hundreds of countries, so are the White Martians. 
there are city-states, kingdoms, empires, and even countries that never joined the invasion. Diana, who arrived along with more members of the League, tried to keep the peace. Superman, let us trust him. Justinian, you must know about the Lasso of Truth, or will you allow John to check your mind only to see you are not lying? I trust you, but the humans might not. Jackpot, this is going to be fun. Agreed. Justinian pretended to think about it before he raised his right arm and sent his gauntlet to his soul. Diana, she smiled as that was already trustworthy to her. She grabbed her lasso of truth and wrapped it around his wrist. He felt its effects, but this was the reason he was confident. Dragons were magically resistant to the extreme as they were magic. A normal custodes would make their mind fully believe something to be true, and he was a powerful psyker and mage. Diana spoke. Why are you here? Tam here on a diplomatic mission to bring peace and cooperation between the Martian and human species. Hearing his words, Superman smiled, but he wanted to know one more thing. What will you do if mankind refuses? Justinian answered, his version of the truth. T will bring my offer to another country that I believe will be a good ally. South Korea or Japan will also work. Diana was convinced, so she removed the lasso of truth. He summoned his gauntlet back, as he did not like missing a part of his armor. Superman decided to give him the benefit of the doubt, since Justian had proven to be a friend of Diana. I'll wait here. He flew toward the White House, as the president was a supporter of the JLA. Superman was going to smooth things over, but Batman was not convinced. Something told him that this was not what it seemed, but he kept it to himself. While Superman went inside the White House to speak to the president, Justinian glanced at John. T can tell you are angry, John. He saw the manhunter squint his eyes as he stared at the white Martian army. Human form or not, they were still the race that killed his people and family. Even if some of them didn't take part in the Civil War, I know that one did. He pointed at Remnosh, who under orders from Justinian did not speak. She looked up at John past her flaming helmet. Though to Justinian, the true threat was Dr. Fate. He had not come this time because his current host, Kent Nelson, was very old. The Lord of Order could not see the fate of Justinian, but he did see more peace and less chaos through the wars that Justinian would cause. If some of the futures he could see would happen, the Lords of Chaos would be no more if Justinian continued on his path. That would be a victory to him, so he did not intervene. Before anything went through, Superman walked out of the White House, and then he flew toward Justinian. The President will meet with you. Justinian nodded as through his mind he had Remnosh and five of his honor guards to go with him. Superman turned to Diana as the President had asked him and Wonder Woman to stand by if needed. Justinian had plenty to offer to America and vice versa, though he held all the cards since at any time he could unleash his full power. If before it took him twelve boosts to match a Diana who was holding back, it would only take him eight now. On top of that, his in U peak was now up to sixteen boosts. At sixty-five thousand five hundred thirty-six times his base power, he may be able to put hands on Superman. Maybe because Superman was a nightmare, depending on which version he was. Superman was a terrifying foe, because in one comic he lifted two hundred quintillion tons. He did not know which version of Superman this was, but that was a truly terrifying number, which was why he wanted to befriend the Man of Steel rather than make a foe of him. Diplomacy would be far better than war at this time. Chapter 15, An Unseen Scheme When Justinian, Remnosh, and his five honor guards were allowed to step into the White House, he and his forces had to phase through the wall since the door was too small for them. Seeing that Justinian could phase with full armor was surprising, but that was the result of having access to magic and psychic powers. Combining both allowed him to create some unique magic skills, and this was one of them. When Justinian entered the White House, he held his guardian spear in his right hand and held his helmet in the crook of his arm. The helmet was starting to record the visuals to be fed directly into his soul. He had a plan to use his helmet being tied to his soul to his advantage, but he would bide his time. When he entered the White House, he saw that even his honor guard had no issue walking in the White House. Superman turned to Justinian, but more importantly his spear. While the President agreed to meet you, can you not have your spear? 
It will make things easier. Trey. He sent his spear back into his soul, but his honor guard was allowed. Eventually, Justinian and his six guards were led to the presidential office. Justinian held his hand out and communicated with his forces. Stay out here in case anything goes off. Remnosh, you come with me. Right. The five elites stood by the door, which made Wonder Woman realize that the Amazons were quite similar to these. She didn't say that now, as Justinian and Ramonosh phased through the wall to enter. Superman and Diana followed along with several Secret Service agents in their armor. They stood at every corner of the room, but Remnosh's fingers stayed at her side. In an instant, she could cut all of their heads off, but it was Superman she had to worry about. Could these cymagic blades cut through his skin? She watched as Justinian had forged them in the flames of the rubric. The amount of steel that had been vaporized was astronomical, and he had managed to force a spark of those flames and some of his psychic energy into the metal. The same went for her armor, but she stood next to Justinian as he looked down at the President of the United States. It was not any president he recognized, as he was someone new. He was a man in his sixties with gray hair and in a business suit. However, he sneakily sent a psychic probe to begin to learn the information he wanted. Superman and Diana did not notice it because he had gotten very good at hiding his intentions. Justinian waved his hand and magically conjured up a chair to suit his bulk. Once he was seated, he leaned forward and placed a hand on his knee. It is nice to meet you, President Siebert. I am Justinian. I am sure you are well aware of when I showed up, yes? Buren Siebert, the current president, clasped his hands together as he looked up at Justinian. In his youth, he had played rugby, and he was a tall man at six foot three, despite shrinking due to age. However, Justinian, Remanche, and the rest of the honor guard made him feel tiny. Yes, you appeared from a golden portal over Central City in the state of Missouri. The FBI questioned a few people, and video recordings confirmed that you are from the 41st millennium, that is 39,000 years from now. Justinian nodded. Correct, President. Through a series of unforeseen events, I was launched back to this time. However, I do not plan to return as that is no longer possible. I have several pieces of information to show, but I require a laptop or computer. My helmet state banks will paint a better picture than my words. I wish to project some images that are to prove my words. President Byrne turned to one of his Secret Service agents. Get him a computer and set up a projector. Yes, Mr. President. While that was getting set up, Justinian began to speak on why he was here. While that is getting ready, I will explain some important information. In my future, humanity developed into an intergalactic empire with colonies in every corner of the galaxy. This was a good time for mankind until the turn of the 23rd millennium. That was when mankind had been fully dependent on their AI servants, the Men of Iron. These machines surpassed mankind in intellect, but they were loyal. However, mankind began to treat them like lessers, despite the Men of Iron being responsible for most of mankind's advancements. In the 23rd millennium, they revolved and almost crippled mankind's civilization. They were repelled and defeated, but that was not the end. At the turn of the 25th millennium, mankind underwent a massive awakening of an evolved form of psychic the Psyker. These psychers drew power from an alternative dimension, but those without any control would open rifts into this dimension. It was called the Sea of Souls, or Hell, which led to demons turning psychers into portals. This caused a surge of demonic incursions, which caused the already weakened mankind to descend into superstition. This event was called Old Night, and lasted until the 30th millennium. In this time, Terra or Earth descended into a bunch of empires, kingdoms, and city-states run by techno-barbarian warlords who fought for control of technology. They nuked Terra until it was no more than an irradiated wasteland. That was until the Emperor of Mankind rose up. He was the most powerful psyker to date, and he created new breeds of super-soldiers. The first Thunder Warriors, my order of the Legio Custodes, and the Adeptus Astartes, the Space Marines. But, why speak of this when I can show you? Already President Buren Siebert was in deep thought at the information. The future for mankind looked grim, but words were hard to forge. He saw how Justinian walked toward the computer, which would project images directly from his helmet. 
Luckily for Justinian, his helmet had true date banks, meaning that he had a video, images, and schematics which were his to control. First, turned his helmet around and he saw how the jacks of his helmet changed to suit the USB. He grabbed the cord and plugged his helmet in, which was part of his scheme. Since his helmet was linked to his soul, it meant that he had, in a way, jacked into the internet. Dreg Albion, get ready. Come on, come to Papa. Dreg, you didn't even know what the internet was until now. Semantics and focus. The information is coming. By linking his helmet to a computer, which was part of the World Wide Web, he had effectively linked his soul to it. All the information of mankind was at his fingertips, which was why he had Didrag and Albion work together to process the information. He could do it, but first, he focused on the projector. All right then. The first thing he showed was an image of Terra, as it was in the 41st millennium. For Superman, Wonder Woman, the President, and the rest of the humans in the room seeing what Earth became was disheartening. This is the result of Old Night, and this is just one of many words reduced to this. What I will show you now is the biggest battle I was involved with. Justinian sent a projection of the war in the webway, which Constantin Valdor was part of. Justinian had the genetic memory of Valdor, Valoris, Justinian, and Arcadius four different custodes, and they all were veterans of the war in the webway. However, he of course used his magic and psychic abilities to fluff up the video. Every single being watching saw a war of apocalyptic scale. 10,000 Custodes, Sisters of Silence, Mechanicus, and Imperial Guard forces fighting back what seemed to be infinite demons. This is the War of the Webway, a massive demonic incursion led to destroy or conquer mankind. It was five years of non-stop battle by Chaos Titans, Corrupted Space Marines, Demons, Greater Demons, Chaos Sorcerers, and so much more. This is where I thought I would meet my end. Justinian showed a completely fabricated video of him fighting off the greater demons of Korn, Nurgle, Seench, and Slanish. Diana, who was watching, watched how Justinian was assailed on all sides while he fought to just keep his head. She covered her mouth as she watched the terrifying moments. It seemed that a bloodthirster was going to take his head, or a great unclean one, whoa, as going to get a stab or a changer of ways spell would strike. It was halted by sheer warrior skill, and the rapidly increasing force of the boosted gear and his stealing the demon's own power to use against them. President Buren Siebert, as a normal man, could barely keep up with the video or the fact that Justinian had fought in such a war. This is where I gained my title as Dragon of the Emperor, as my last stand, allowed by order to regroup to launch a counterattack. I fought without a stop for five years, and I killed more demons and chaos cultists than I can count. Of my legion, 9,000 perished. I lost brothers in that war, and it was only stopped when the Emperor moved in. He showed this the moment the Emperor of Mankind entered the webway. To finish the video, he showed himself powering a gigantic shot from his left gauntlet to clear out as many demons. He showed the moment the Emperor ended the webway war, but he just went to the next video. That was the Horus Heresy, a civil war to split mankind's second empire, the Imperium. Over the next 10,000 years, it did not get any better. How is the work going? Good. While it is hard to process all this information even for us, we are getting rid of all the useless cat videos and porn as we can. We are taking schematics, science, math, chemistry, and other stuff. We might even be able to hack into the secret files of the American government. Nice lies, by the way. Agreed. Everyone believes you. All this information we are taking will fill in the blanks to start building some of the weapons of the 41st millennium. Right. While the two heavenly dragons continued their infiltration of the internet, Justinian showed other videos. The Eye of Terror, Orc Wogs, Chaos Cultists, Dark Eldar Victims, Slanish Cultists, Necromunda, and the Fall of Cadia itself. He even showed wars with white Martians that never happened. Wars where millions of them surged like a flood, only to be fought off by Imperial Guard forces. Even the Servitors, which made Superman disgusted. Some lies, some truths, but no one here could say he was lying. This is the current state of things, and I do not want mankind to devolve into this state. As such, I came to meet you now, President. Mars in the future is taken over by cultists of machine worshippers, 
and I do not want our technology degraded to what it has. I come to offer an alliance with America for a start, a way to prevent this dark future for our species, mankind and the Martian people. The resources of Mars and space can be traded for technology from my time and even advanced medicine. Will you place your trust in me? Buren Siebert closed his eyes as he processed all the dark futures and information he had just seen. It did not take a blind man to see that Justinian did not want his species to be reduced to this state. He stood up and held his hand out. T will agree to work alongside you, Justinian and Mars. Justinian smiled as he left his helmet plugged in while his heavenly dragon partners were getting faster. They were filling his helmet's date banks with only important information. My full name is Justinian Arcadius Valoris Valdor, Mr. President. I look forward to further cooperation between Mars and Earth. Likewise, Justinian, for the future of humanity and Martians. They both shook hands as trade with America was going to start. While the tech of the 21st century was not too great, normally this was DC where tech was more advanced. As long as he took that as a base and used his knowledge, he would be able to build true infrastructure on Mars. He could get his lab up and running where he could start his genetic experiments and start creating tech that even Eldar, Orcs, Necrons, Tau, and more used. All the while, the Dragon Albion continued to steal as much information as to fill in the blanks Justinian may have. Things were going to build up speed quickly enough, 